as the divine play is unfolding everything connected into everything else, but separate in its fluctuations, its wavy forms, its beauty is made by the shimmering play of contrast. And this is what we are here to examine together. Thank you for having summoned me this day with the love of all existence, the unified field of the Brahman. I greet you and embrace you within this sacred moment. How are you, Jaitan? Thank you. Yes, uh, I am uh, as good as I can be. Uh, of course, so thank you for asking. I uh, really wanted to get into not really necessarily just visualization, but of course, um, specific states that we go into when it comes to lucid dreaming or when it comes to, as I mentioned, to Maj, where consciousness hasn't really fully engaged in a human's rational mind. Uh, I lo I'd love a greater understanding of that because uh, there's elements of this which is, uh, well, it, it's not studied enough at this stage. So uh, please do uh, elaborate on anything you want to share. Thank you. The reason that you have called in my energy this day, the Lord Vishnu, is because I preside over these worlds within my being. I make what may seem separate to human beings into a unified state. And so it is much more easy for me to comprehend how consciousness weaves these layers together. Indeed, they are a part of the same tapestry, though to you they may seem as a front side and a back side, because you are, in a sense, discerning in a very human and in a very high-minded fashion. When you understand this difference that you point out, that consciousness hasn't really engaged the rational mind in these states of lucid dreaming, you use this term sometimes in your language, the light of reason. You see that the waking state is then connected to the rational, the rational, the reasonable mind, the thing that sorts and differentiates. While within these dream states of lucid dreaming, what we could say is that you have managed to connect so much of your wider identity, you have solidified your etheric body in a type of consistency where it is not completely absorbed in the dream state, but you have disengaged the rational mind that sorts out the outside world. And therefore you get to move into these states of fanciful, fantastic, fantasy-like reality that you experience in lucid dreaming while still being a type of agent, a type of self, a type of focused being that also can bring quite a lot of memory back to the reasonable state, the state of daylight. In interesting. So when it comes to uh, the layers of creativity in, in these states, how do they differ from someone who is in a waking conscious state? They differ in not in the level of receptivity, we could say, but in the level of creativity. What I mean by that is that if you were to think of inspiration, of these layers of impulse that come into your being and that prod you to action, to creation, to vision, to understanding, these are, in a sense, channel content to use this image. These are condensations moving down from your wider, higher self and into the person that you are, but there is a, let's say, apprehension, a type of controlled, ordered way of creating 
in the physical, in what you call the waking state, the state where you have agency. This is something that's also quite specific to human adults. So with children, their experience of reality is much more akin to lucid dreaming because you will see that in the lucid dream state, you receive as much inspiration, con context, flow, creative energy, but it is not being funneled into a reasonable process, a rational process. It instead superimposes itself and creates reality at the very instant it is received. So this is, you could say, more divine or also more akin to this divine creation, this principle of the divine that I fully embody and express. And therefore, it is a very helpful state to integrate or to play around with in your sleeping state, as you may find that it actually also then widens your general state of connection to skills such as we could call the manifestation, create creative engineering of your own life, life in the waking state. Of course, I understand as well that not everyone can, of course, there's different practitioners who can lucid dream uh there's different practitioners who can really use that dream state or that that consciousness state to really conjure different ideas and and, uh, and principles for the, the people who struggle with gaining in into this sort of realm of activity what what is it that they're specifically maybe not missing but not really understanding that they really ought to understand to really get access to those states. To a divine intelligence such as myself, that is a strange but also helpful question in that it delineates some of these human perspectives. So we could say that within that question, much of the answer is contained that what it needs to do is that it needs to cease imposing criteria or expectations on what is supposed to happen in that state. You could relate this to something as simple as that experience that human beings have that when they really feel that they need to go to sleep in order to get a certain amount of rest, then that is in and of itself preventing them from reaching the sleep state because it is a type of straining of the mind, of the will, of the effort that is in complete opposition to the, let's call it the flowing receptive mercy of the sleep state. So that is a perspective that in a sense, you need to relinquish your expectations. Another helpful example is if you have looked at stereograms, for instance, these 3D images, you will find that it is exactly the tension, the looking for the figure that makes it invisible. While as soon as you are able to defocus your eyes, it will immediately come into your experience. Then the easiest way we could say to prevent this strain from happening is to look in other venues because the state of lucid dreaming, interesting as it may be, is also, it lends itself to a certain type of temperament who also likes a certain neatness in their inspiration. That is, you may find, for instance, that people who are more inclined to what is sometimes called divine madness or expressed in the original meaning of the word enthusiasm, taking in the God into themselves, that they find that this rapturous state, this chaos of inspiration that they can create within the waking state 
is more helpful for them connecting to the wider perspective of themselves. And these people will tend to dream in other ways that are perhaps also more chaotic, more, say, st less story-like in the way that they unfold. So there is both an element of character and preference, but for everyone, the idea is to let go to receive. Thank you. That's so. It's uh, in simplicity. It's it's very, uh, very helpful to get that that sort of answer. Um, and specifically, which... yes, but to not leave you empty-handed, I will give a type of technique so you could you could say that connected to this lack of inspiration this lack of expectation and thereby we could say surrendering to inspiration gazing is a helpful way of doing this you can if you are more inclined to use the ears you can also use toning or singing but often this type of gazing at something that is pleasant often it can be a colored orb, might be of glass, or it may be a gemstone, or it may be something pretty or geometric. But this sense of losing yourself in looking at something, that is actually training the mind to this state of receptivity, where it's still focused in apprehending. So it's still conscious, but it is taking in this unknown of, of the object of studying. And this is because this is a, the type of attitude that needs to be carried over in the dream state to be lucid in the dreaming state that is still focused in the perceiver while you are receiving. Wow, that's uh, a, yeah, that, that's amazing to hear, actually, because that, that paints the picture to me that, well, I don't know if there's an exact correlation between people who tend to lose themselves in their work or tend to have I wouldn't say uh malistic or malignant obsessions but more so obsessiveness in a very I guess healthy way um not too sure where I'm going with this but is there a specific connection towards what you've mentioned there with losing yourself or as I would say obsession in in a practice or obsession in someone's work uh, is there a connection there between what that person does and what they lucid dream or dream in, in fact yes often the dream state is yes it is also connected to sleep and it is poorly understood by the waking mind the best way to approach it and that is indeed what was discovered by psychoanalysis, for instance. But that is that it always tends to bring balance to the overall state of individual consciousness. So the person who is very focused in their work will often experience, depending on which attitude they are, taking into their work, but they will often experience in dream states certain counterpoints to that. So for instance, the person who is very, to take a stereotypical example, very caught up in their life at the office, they may often have dreams at night of very strange things, often quite unheard of things, naughty things, things that seem to punctuate that situation, that room, that space of the office and the taboos or simply the parameters that lie for behavior therein, those are often the dreams that they will have. And we could also say that the more dreary the person turns their life into, often the more fantastic their dream life will also be. But then let's say the dreary mind is ill-suited to carry these fantasies into their conscious existence. So often people who have this inclination will have a hard time lucid dreaming because the element of recall and being focused as themselves in a dream doesn't quite match up with the dream. 
So you will find that the human beings who are the best suited or have the easiest time of approaching this discipline of lucid dreaming, those are usually people who have an openness to fantasy. And we can even mean that as a, the type of genre of expression. That is, it's people who have that like to look at the world in this expansive concept, in this imaginative um, way of seeing it. They will often find that the jump from their experience and into reality isn't or into the dream state and their real experience, they aren't that far from each other. So it's quite easy to train that step of remaining conscious and waking yourself up in the dream state, so to speak. Then you ask about work, because we could also outline this, that it is often a type of what is called karma yoga, this type of losing yourself in your work. That is that people who get very obsessed with their work often do so because there is not necessarily an expecta expectation, but because it sweeps them up in a type of flow state, which is indeed a type of transcendental experience. So this is something that actually brings them in connection to their higher self. Or as it may sometimes seem that the person who is very good at working at a call cell or a center and selling subscriptions or something similar can actually use this as a type of transcendental technique but losing yourself in anything simply for the purpose of doing it is a type of elation a heightening of your vibration love it and and when it comes to or when it comes to, um, I don't know if you'd call them spiritual enlightened teachers or any other phrase of work, or let's say, if we take, of course, you're being as Vishnu as, a, as an example, what would someone of that level dream of, or, or does it not really conceptualize correctly? It's a very interesting question also that you have summoned me this day to answer it because often these beings will also be perceived by at least some human traditions to be avatars of me to be embodiments of the great universal creative loving compassionate principle that participates in existence but also sits without it and around it and therefore, you could say that their dream states are often a return into the divine unity. So they rarely dream as such. Rather, they will find that they often dream more in emotional intensities, in direct configuration. You will see that some of your dreams are often symbolic translations of physical reprogramming. So the most direct way of understanding this is, for instance, the person who needs to pee all night and then is dreaming of waterfalls and flushing toilets and so forth and so on. And this is often what happens in dreams that you will find if you are dreaming of elevators, that there may be a type of alignment of your central energy channel going on that the mind is then translating in its symbolic dimension in the dream state. And there, this will become, let's say, less symbolic and more, I believe sometimes the term is called an index, but it is this idea where there is unity between the thing that is expressed and the ways it is expressed. So for instance, this enlightened state of dreaming will often be experienced certain energies, colors, reconfigurations, moving by in the night, because as long as you have a physical body, there is this element of maintenance that is also pertinent to it, though often you will also find that these 
enlightened beings, they tend to sleep far less as their bodies reconstitute themselves in the waking state far better. There's a, there's a few things you mentioned there that I, that I want to uh, address as well. That of course, you mentioned that high beings tend to really address well, or dream more so in emotional intensities. Um, would that, let's say, would that directly involve what's potentially happening in the universe? Let's say if there's, maybe if we go back to the, I, I don't know, draconic era and if the 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 enlightened being would they have what i'm trying to say is would they have different dreams in accordance to the way consciousness is or currently is situated uh yeah it's a, it's a beautiful question i would like to mirror back to you how perceptive you are how much you understand of this concept intuitively and then I can respond, yes, this is indeed how it works. This is also why I take different shapes in different lifetimes. When I visit and incarnate in other states of being, other planets, uh, between other conscious beings, I, of course, also take shapes that are recognizable to them. But in some lifetimes, I also come as animals or other sacred beings to this planet whatever is needed in that energy configuration that exists in the time space i step into that will be the shape that i i take and so that is indeed to my mind there is not any difference between the different layers of sleep and the waking state except for the conscious operations. Rather, I have this state of wakefulness that lies beyond existence itself. And then I am able to engage as light beings in this dreaming state while still being in the awake state. But the processes that are running through this bodily state in this dreaming state of mind they will be very connected to the specific energies. And indeed, they have a level of redemption, we could say, of the collective, even in the dream quality. That is, when one of your enlightened masters dreams a dream, they are resetting the balance of the cosmos within that frame that they find themselves in. And this is a type of what is sometimes known in more modern contexts as grid work or light work reprogramming that energy grid that exists within where conscious beings focus themselves. That is much of what the dream state serves in these beings who come to visit, illuminate, enlighten, wake up. Fascinating. And of course, you mentioned there about just stepping into time and almost configuring configuring yourself as the opportunity sees fit or as what consciousness is, 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 is talking uh, to you about. How can, I guess, human beings just, in a way, have that same concept, but do it in a rational mind or is it even possible to step into time that way as you've described it, when there's the rationality and, and the egoic nature uh, of humans going on constantly indeed it is you are cultivating it anybody who is on this path of consciousness expanding of taking in more light of becoming more aware of themselves as an incarnation and an infinite being simultaneously. You are training this state of mind. And one of the very helpful ways that you are training it is by engaging with this lucid dreaming. Because the more you lucid dream, the more you also become aware 
that there is really not much difference between you being asleep and envisioning yourself as yourself in this quite a fantastic creation where you can fly or have certain experiences that you want to. And then you being awake and being surrounded by this strange, fantastic creation where you can have experiences that you want. So there is a bridge being built between elements that seem disparate for the more egoic being because ego in and of itself does not exist as anything else as a, a, but than a set of boundaries, limitations, parameters that are set around consciousness for it to be restrained. And it is in the loving move, it is in the loving removal of those restraints, those training wheels on the ego that you gradually grow the self that is the highest eternal part of you and the unity that it has with your incarnation. That's a very uh, helpful understanding of uh, the responsibility of, of the ego, which is, yeah, yeah I think you, you've said it better than uh, anything that I've uh, heard. So thank you for that. Um, I think I think what's important to maybe investigate or uh, discover more of is uh, the well, this is in relation to time as well, but of course the ephemeric nature of uh, time and dreaming. Of course, one hour in maybe a dream state could could feel like months on end in uh in, in earthly time minutes <laughs> let's say um and i think it's interesting that you mentioned previously about you just stepping into time and just reacting towards what's needed as i've said before um i think my question is what i'm trying to say is uh, how can we use time more effectively in either our dream states or our conscious states because of what I'm noticing here is that there's a almost like a gap within time at the, that we experience when it comes to maybe being very connected to the work that we're that we're doing and we lose track of time there's always a passage of time where nothing exists or things slow down as some people think about um I'm sure all of this is in relation to my question around dreams, but is there anything you can really mention about that? Because it seems to me like when that happens to a human being, it's just them stepping into the nature of what's mixed together in terms of time, consciousness, and, and breaking past uh, other belief patterns. You are true in this observ observation you are seeing something deep that is unfolding in the meeting of all these parts that were egoically separated off. That is, for instance, the categories of space, the feeling of obligation, the mental constructs around the having to do something, the body feeling that it is putting itself through certain tasks and operations. When all these things come together, they merge into this state where time actually seems to dissipate. That it may, if it is passing at all, it is often passing as an afterthought. And people can be so absorbed that they are surprised that a whole day has passed. And they can also be so absorbed that they feel that they have all of the sudden done incredible amounts of work in 20 minutes for instance and it almost seems as if time stopped itself and didn't really exist in the time that they did this work when they were in this flowing transcendental state because this is a type of unity state 
where you reconnect. And the interesting thing is that you use this quite paradoxical, but also beautiful word of effective. How can you be more effective? Because then the paradox is that it is again removing those parameters because the idea of spending time more prudently breeds a type of scarcity mindset. It breeds an idea that there is a limited amount of time and that needs to be done. I understand this is perhaps more pronounced in those parts of the world where there is an idea of the final judgment of an end point to time that is coming and that life and existence is not infinite. But there could be no other structure to the universe than a cycle. Everything that is will come again until it is resolved because within this circle, there is a perfect harmony where all points support each other and that keeps them from collapsing into the center. So this is almost the idea that you find in human work that instead of performing the meditative acts or the contemplative acts, these disciplines that are often known as Raja Yoga, you will find that this Karma Yoga, this yoga of action, this immersing yourself and connecting into the divine through action, that is just as helpful, a helpful, just as helpful a way to become what you were meant to become in this lifetime, to fulfill your karma with no expectation, with no hesitation, that is, we could say. This is the deep secret of happiness. There's uh, an amount of archi archi archetypical uh, work here uh, that I'm gathering, uh, of course. You mentioned two distinctions of karma yoga and, and raja yoga, uh, one benefiting someone more than the other. Is it the nature of what we're doing uh, it's really just examining what pathway is actually best if it's the karma yoga of doing the actions that align you or if it's the raja yoga of allowing the cyclical nature to uh, unfound itself in, in your life is that typically what maybe perhaps your perception is of when of course, someone is, is looking to become what they really want to become or need. Uh, is it those two specifically in terms of Raja and, and Karmic Yoga? Or are there maybe perhaps other elements that we just tend to see in, 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 in I guess, the human work? Yeah. <laughs> yes. You are asking very clear questions. That is indeed another way is this road of discernment, this way of carrying things, observations, the processes of mind or deep knowledge. If you carry these to their logical extremities and there the mind will also come into these deep realizations. That is if you ponder anything long enough, you will both see that it begins to unravel itself and thereby it connects to everything else. So this may be more of your own personal approach, for instance, that you are also a person who enjoys thinking about things. Then for some, it is the states of rapture that bring them there. It is this way of ecstasy, we could say, that indeed is necessary for them to 
attain these experiences of unity, but always leads back to the divine source, the one unified being, the one true being that we all come from. And which way you take is not necessarily important. Rather, what is important is that you discern your circumstances, your what is sometimes called Dharma, this idea of your truth, the way that is set out for you. That is the most helpful way of understanding it. In, we could call them slower eras, in eras where there were less chaotic upheaval, less change at play. Often societies would order themselves in this way. There would be those who fought, those who prayed, those who served, those who worked. And this would be a type of way of discerning, even of accommodating the divine, that it would then be perceived that certain spirits could be born into the place that their most meaningful course of being could unfold. But in these times, you are being asked, as your energy fields are expanding, to learn more about your deep conscious nature and to step into your willful creation of yourselves. So the question is indeed, rather, where do you find that these transcendental states, they reach you? And then go down that road and see that it will take you back to the radiant lotus sitting at the center of the cosmos. Mm, it's uh, such a, a <laughs> very beautiful way of, uh, uh, I guess, putting uh, putting the nature of life into into perspective there, uh, which is. Again, something that I'll have to listen back to uh, once more to to really understand, well, not really understand, but uh, feel in, in the correct way uh, those words. Um, of course, what we're really looking into is around alignment, and, and as you said, the finding the Dharma or your truth, um, and and stepping into willful creation. But when it, from what I'm Understanding, of course, there's a clear opposite towards that that people tend to gravitate towards. Uh, maybe if we say, well, we could look into the opposite of uh, willful creation, if we can. Uh, I think that would be helpful. Yes. But you may notice that this is also a pendulum that is swinging. So there will always be, let us say, an element of the opportunity to get lost within reality, within yourself, that the maze needs to be so challenging that it's not that easy to get to the center. That is that the great freedom of this cosmos, this all creation is exactly so free that it also allows people to move through experience and then re-experience of failing, of chasing wind, of seeking to find the sensor of something that has no substance. But you may find that in these times of change, you are also creating situations and remedies in your societies that actually forward this process. So we could, for instance, take such a phenomenon as social media. This allows indeed for certain types of experiences, certain types of expansions, certain types of sharings that are very helpful and deep to people. 
but the, it also has the added contrast or the opportunity to lose yourself within the cultivation of something that is without substance. And you will find as for instance, people who, well, you will find, for instance, in the example of people who pursue the projection of an image and the cultivation of this, that that will quite rapidly seem in divine time at least, that will quite rapidly bring them to the realization of the deep hollowness, the deep unsatisfactory na nature of this pursuit. Because the more you try to turn yourself into an image, something that is separated from your true core, the more that true core will become miserable. It will be, a, it will, it will wake up through that experience, the disconnection. So you may find that the state that you are actually experiencing as a species at the moment is that you are in, let's call them a hangover state. You're in the state that often connects to early youth or let's say the movement from youth and into adulthood, where you find that pursuit of gratification, for instance, or short-sighted pleasures is something that does not really speak to a deeper layer of you. Right, and of course, well, now we're looking into the layers of human beings uh, uh, currently as we're speaking. And what I wanted to go into as well is, of course, not necessarily the the feeling of emptiness, but I think the uh, the, the the I mean it seems like uh, anything can uh, in our dreams if it's an empty stage for someone to create it could be created uh, through someone's uh, perception or even. Uh, what someone's feeling uh, currently and I think what I've seen is of course people using the thematics of emptiness in different ways or even inversely in a negative way be it if someone is uh, mentally feeling empty and they don't necessarily know what to do uh, with their lives uh, maybe some people may call them in a depressive state, then other cases involved someone absolutely thriving in emptiness. Uh, I just want to understand what's the, the distinction that two people can have with a theme such as emptiness. I know we you know, we've spoken a lot about the pendulum swinging and I think this is one example of what you what what is meant by that uh, quite clearly, um, but I'd love to really discuss that in more detail. Just in terms of, um, I, I mean, would it be discernment that when someone is in in an emptiness space that then they're just not discerning the correct path to take to get them out of there? Uh, yeah. So I'd love I'd love a, a, some thoughts around around that theme. Uh, yes, because notice that you are quite good at seeing these phenomena as double-sided, and that is indeed helpful because there is always both a positive and a negative quality to anything that exists. But we could, to separate them in language, call the one state spaciousness. That is, that is a type of emptiness that is fulfilled. This is often what you find in sages, enlightened states of being, that it is this allowance of 
nothing that is latched onto, nothing that is necessarily brought into that space. Whereas the other type of emptiness you describe, it is often in more archaic words term vanity, which also indeed means empty, uh, emptiness. And this creates a type of state of vacuum. So this is a very fluctuating state. And if it seems from the outside to appear happy or fulfilled in this, its lack of discernment, it is because it at that moment is succeeding in drawing into its vacuum something that still has a quality of vitality to it. So, and that is usually, it can be other people's attention, for instance, which is automatically vitalizing because that is essentially shining your divine light on something in reality, thereby helping to give it form. It can also be sensual pleasures of one kind or another. It can be the gratification of the image, but these are all very, very fleeting satisfactions that then create as they expand that empty vacuum, that vanity, they then become less and less fulfilling. So you will find that this state is also characterized by a constant need to attempt to reinvent itself. And there you find, for instance, phenomena such as fashion. There is, of course, also the positive quality of the decorative splendor of the world. But you will find that this constant need to change attitudes, appearances, is something that sets out this unsteadiness, that marks it out as something that is not of truth, that is not a stable being, that is not of a spacious quality. And there you are correct in saying that, well, discernment then often wakes up again from unconsciousness itself. This is the type of cure that it begins to diagnose itself, that it becomes aware that something is wrong. And then it begins to look for things that seem of another quality. And that is why the work that you are doing in your life, in your way of being down here, is so important because you may notice that you are already attracted to the opposites of this. And the opposites are, for instance, lucid dreaming. The opposites are all these techniques, attitudes, ways of being that connect into the fullness, the wonder, the mystery, the deeper layers of reality that are the deep revitalizing form that human beings need to connect to in order to feel truly happy and fulfilled. Wonderful. And how would you characterize someone who has qualities of spaciousness? They are, you will often find a type of placidity around them. Sometimes you will even find them described with this image of the still lake or the calm ocean, something that is moving at a quality where it, even though it's changing on the surface, seems to be connected to something still. That is also why it is a quality that grows in human beings who do not walk too far off their path, but it will grow in many human beings as they age. And therefore there is often this quality of pleasant stillness around people who have accepted more of this spaciousness. Because 
it is indeed with this acceptance, it is with the quality of knowing that by relinquishing control, the deeper states of, well, we could say control or fulfillment definition are actually reached. So there is this quality of retreating into the receiving mode before you then create this circuitry of creation or expression. And this is why this ability to also connect to the dream states, to be more of that expansive self that defined you both in the dream state and in the waking state, that that is something that is very helpful in connection to developing this spacious stillness. It's interesting as well in, in terms of, well, I guess over the last couple of years, uh, and again, it's improving, uh, this idea of, uh, of course, maybe people like uh, Mads or people uh, who you would characterize as uh, as healers or practitioners uh, inadvertently not taking up the desired spaciousness in actual space uh, enough. Or it could be almost uh, conceived as them not really allowing the uh, abilities to be seen or thrived enough. Uh, and again, we've talked about the opposites a little bit, and it's, it's just quite interesting how that fundamental belief of someone who is doing a very powerful piece of work isn't necessarily in their mind or conscious belief allowed to take up the space that is, is needed. Uh, maybe it's because of the archaic terms around what, what that means. Uh, related to power and, and related to other other things that are going on there. But um, is there anything you could comment on that at all, that aspect? We sense this is a very meaningful point you are touching on because you will find that it is exactly through this compression that many spirits have been through, many human beings have been through, that they have begun to discover these alternate states of being, that it was through, let's say, a feeling of being pressured, held down, disempowered, chained, we could almost say, that these beings who are now, and we can indeed include you in this, that they are breaking free to a wider state of potential. And what is then happening, and what will be happening also in the coming decade is that you are indeed learning to connect more of your bright vibration, that you have been growing more in stillness to a wider reality in different ways. But much of what has been going on is also, we could say, uh, more preliminary grid work. So many of the outer parameters of being have had to become reset in order to form the base and the platform on which you can then begin to make this expansion. So. For instance, I am aware that you are now refocusing yourself in a different physical environment. And this is indeed a symptom that there have been resonances that have been, let's say, slightly fluttering in their quality that are now settling, landing, and creating a nest and a space from which they can survey the world. Yes, absolutely. I uh, 
fully agree with that. And uh, yes, that's uh, incredible to to understand that it's not necessarily more to do with them not wanting to take the space. It's just the fact that perhaps their preliminary grid work needed to be in place for them to really act in certain ways. Uh, and I think for a lot of people, including myself, there's been a lot of preliminary grid work over the last five to seven years, uh, which is now culminating in something different happening now, which is encouraging, uh, to say the least. Uh, I'm a little bit mindful of the time. Of course, we are approaching uh, our transmission uh, to be ended. So is there anything else that you would like to please uh, bring up or suggest or for me to ponder uh, any any words would uh, be appreciated to finalize this. Yes. I would love for you to consider that you are in a sense already lucid dreaming. That this is the state that you are describing is a type of fractalized state, a miniature of what your higher self is already doing. So it is restful, it is protected, and it is seated in a far beyond where it can't be touched by the fluctuations of this world. And this allows for an incredible freedom in your expression in this reality, because this exactly means that you can indeed surrender to the realization that you are creating this reality, that you are an architect of it, and that you have the skills, the foundation, the space indeed to expand. So you may find that you are well, personally, looking at a very long life because there is indeed much of this spiritual energy in you. This holy quality has reconfigured itself at a quite early stage in your life. And you may know that when you move into these states of absorption, these states of alignment, your physical body, it extends its vitality, it ages as a, at a far slower pace. So the question is indeed, what will you do with a hundred years to come? What are the things that you would like to see happen? And allow yourself then the steadiness within this process to dream, to connect, to expand, expand, and to become whatever you seek to become, and that you have already become in the highest vision of yourself, dreamt by that infinite part of you. And I would ask. Yes, thank you too, dear Tim. But I would ask you, is there anything of any kind that you would like me to settle before I leave this day? Personal advice, advice on dreaming, things that you feel, questions that your heart is still carrying? No, not specifically. Um, I think only the... the... The question would be is what uh what does happiness look like for someone who is ether etherical? It looks like the joyful participation in willful creation. That is it is through this feeling of voluntary voluntarily being a part of something and investing your energy, your truth, your 
strength, your beauty, your love, all these wonderful qualities, as soon as you are selecting a space that is right for you and you are feeling safe in letting those inner, higher emotions, those deep, true qualities of you coming into that space that you have selected, then that is happiness. And that exists on all layers of the physical universe. So even beings who are still in the physical, but far beyond you in frequency scale, they still have this deep impulse that they simply enjoy being in places where they play around with wanting, willing things, and then letting those things unfold and being taken aback by the mysterious creation that they are observing because there is always a more, even to the divine mind, nothing is like a clockwork. It is an expansion. It is, there is an element of randomness within all parameters that are set that make the fun happen, so to speak. So with that, also have fun with the slight unpredictabilities that you are facing in your life because the more unpredictable the more mystery and the more capable you feel and you can surely feel capable in the work that you have already done to bring you to this place the more capable you feel the more secure you will be in that the unpredictability is exactly the thing that you came here to create so with that, dear Tim, I will leave you this day with the love from my Lord Vishnu and from all creation. I thank you for having created this moment, for having faceted this gemstone of an interaction with me, and for having marveled at it together. Goodbye, dear one. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>